Oh, there I am. Well, good morning. If you are seeing my face and hearing my voice, you know that you're in the right place. At least I hope you're, you're in the right place because it is, uh, it's now time once again to put on the brakes, grab a cup of coffee and join the conversation. This is Coffee Breaks with Steve. Wow. I need that this morning. For some reason, I just really need the go juice this morning. The coffee is is not only tasting good to me, it's feeling good to me. See, a few people are already on the stream here. Good morning, Jerry Thompson, Kathy Garlic, Shalan Shepard, Jason Wheelock, Alan McCormick. Shalan, thank you for making sure everybody's drinking. I hope you have your morning beverage, whatever it might be with you. Um, for me, it's typically my cup of coffee. For you, it might be your coffee, it might be your tea, it might be water, whatever it is. I just want you to grab your cup and, and be a part of what we're doing here today. This is going to be, I think, both a fun and interesting conversation. Good morning, Jay Zetterval, Kathy McCormick. Carissa is here. Um, yeah, we'll bear with banners. Carissa is our director, and one of the things that she does is make sure that those little banners you see across the bottom are flowing and updating and doing what we're talking about. And sometimes her computer gets a little bit cantankerous, so no problems. And uh, Corey Ann, good morning. Lila, good morning. Melinda, good morning. Good. We're getting a, a good group on here, which means we're going to have a great conversation. I want to hit some special days. I want to introduce our guest today because this conversation is going to be even more I think interesting and go a little more in depth because we have someone who's going to join us today who knows what they're talking about. But I think we all have things to share here. Um, if you are tuning in, do what these people are doing and make sure that you say good morning in the chat so that we know you're here and I can acknowledge you. And as we get into the conversation, make sure that you're asking your questions, making your comments and being a part of this conversation. This isn't just about me, not even about just me and our special guest. Talking, this is all of us virtually sitting around the big coffee table. So I want you to be a part of it. Let me quickly get to some special days today so that we can get on to our topic. And uh, hi, Steve Vogel. Good to see you here, my friend. And uh, let me just say this. Interesting special days this week. You know that I love to focus sometimes on food. And there are a few of those things in here. But I think it's interesting <laughs> that to start uh, this one, we have National Honey Bee Awareness Day is today. I know that that uh, some people who typically tune in, I don't necessarily see them all here this morning, are or have been involved in raising honeybees. Hang on, throat's going dry right away. I don't know that coffee helps, but I do it anyway. Um, hi, Georgie, good to see you here. Kim Baker, good meowning. And after Mewn and Happy Catter Day. Absolutely. So this is National Honeybee Awareness Day. It's not necessarily always on the 20th, but it is on the third Saturday of August. And it is an official national day. This is also World Mosquito Day. Isn't that interesting that they're both here now? Honeybee Awareness Day is about raising and keeping the health and vitality of honeybees alive. World Mosquito Day actually goes back to the first discovery that malaria was associated with mosquitoes and trying to work to educate and to provide proper sanitation in areas that need it to try to avoid mosquito spreading disease. That's what that's all about. Sunday, tomorrow, the 21st, National Spumoni Day. You know what Spumoni is? It's that type of ice cream that has like chocolate or vanilla and like different kinds of dried fruits and stuff in it. It's a mixture. They often, so Spaghetti Factory always offers Spumoni and there are other places you can get it. Yeah, it's one of those ice creams. I think that either people, Ooh, I love Spumoni or they don't like Spumoni. I don't think there are a lot of people who are in between. Tomorrow is also National Senior Citizens Day. We're supposed to, and that was actually a, an official day starting in 1988 by President Reagan, I believe, is that right? To acknowledge and recognize, Reagan was a senior citizen when he was president, so that probably was part of it. But you know, where does becoming a senior citizen start? 
legally, technically, I'm a senior citizen. I don't feel like I'm a senior citizen, but we're supposed to acknowledge and look out for our senior citizens. You should do that every day, including me. Look out for me. Um, on Wednesday, the 24th, iconic American restaurants day. That can either be like certain chains that we really love. Like some people really love Chili's or Red Robin or Applebee's or even Denny's. But there are also individual iconic restaurants around the country that just, they have a reputation. So that's the day we're supposed to recognize those. 25th, National Banana Split Day. It's another one I'd give a thumbs up to. Um, may not put Spumoni ice cream on your banana split, but it, you know you might be a banana split person. I actually had one not that long ago. It was on a hot day. We were out with our grandsons and we stopped at an ice cream place and I got a banana split. It was good. Friday, the 26th, National Dog Day. Not hot dog day. We're not talking food here. Dog Day. So that's a day that we celebrate dogs. Um, how many of you are dog people? dog owners, and some people don't think of it as owning their dogs, they just, dogs are a member of their family. How many of you have family members who are canine? Well, Friday is a day to really celebrate, not only celebrate the various breeds, but celebrate rescue dogs specifically. And then also Friday is National Toilet Paper Day. It's not an official national holiday, but I think given some of the shortages we experienced during COVID, maybe we would wanna make it a national holiday. And then also Friday the 26th is Women's Equality Day. It's marking the day in 1920 when the 19th Amendment was passed, giving women the vote. So we celebrate that on Friday. Okay, I said I didn't want to spend a ton of time on those. If you have a special day this week, a birthday, an anniversary, something else special that you want us to celebrate with you, make sure you put that in the chat so we can acknowledge it. And let me just quickly take a look here and see if there's anybody I haven't said hi to yet. Didi Kiso, good morning, Didi. Good to see you here. And uh, once again, if you are signing in and you're watching the show, make sure that you join in the chat. Let us know that you're here and be a part of the conversation. I want to get to the topic today and I want to introduce our special guest. And before I bring her on, I want to tell you a little bit about her so you know where she's coming from and who she is. Some of you already know her, actually. But uh, I'm going to be introducing Addie Grow. And Addie is a graduate of Whitworth, Whitworth University and has an MA from Western Washington University in English Studies. Prior to her current role in talent acquisition, she worked for nearly 10 years at Whitworth University as a lecturer and career advisor. She enjoys helping friends and family with their job searches in her spare time and says updating a resume for someone she cares about is one of the most rewarding and relaxing ways to spend an evening. I love that. Uh, Addie's husband is both a busy gigging musician and the full-time stay-at-home parent who takes care of their two boys while Addie works a job that she loves. So without anything further, let me introduce and bring on Addie Grow. Addie, good morning. Good morning, Steve. <laughs> that was really, that was great. Thank you. It's a, you're welcome. It's a great bio. And, you know, I, one of the reasons that I really wanted to get you involved today is that it, it's easy for me to talk about my own experiences in the past in job searching. I mean, I recently retired. We're going to talk about that a little bit too, I think. But, you know, there was there were various times in my career where how you went about applying for jobs. And I even worked at various times in management roles or in recruiting roles where I was part of the hiring process. Mm -hmm. And that has all continually evolved. But we've seen a lot of changes in workplace settings and how that's impacted uh, because of COVID. And I'm just wondering, just to start with, in a very broad sense, from your perspective and the work that you do and have done, how much has COVID impacted the job market, both for recruiters mm -hmm. and for job seekers? I mean, that is such a huge question because yeah. <laughs> the labor force participation rate had already been declining, right? Um, but then COVID hit and we saw and we're still seeing the great resignation. You participated in this, right? Uh, we lost nearly 3 million Americans who took early retirement, oh, yeah. right? So there, it was already declining. And then we had that accelerated. In addition, you know, the effects of COVID, uh, I think another like 3 million folks left the workforce because of childcare, yeah. right? Lost our childcare options. And so they left the workforce and many of them aren't returning. 
Mm -hmm. They haven't returned. They found a way to make it work so they don't have to return. And so we're seeing a huge, a huge gap between the 10 million jobs we have posted and only like 5 million folks who are available to take those jobs. And that affects a lot of things. I mean, we think, it, you know, for people like me or other people who may either be in a stable job situation themselves or be retired or, or not working, you know, staying outside of the workforce, they may go, well, that's great, whatever. But it affects all of us because we see differences in in the service that we can get. Sometimes, you know, availability. Carol and I have been experiencing that. We were looking for a service to help with some landscaping and finding a company that had capacity to take us on. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that because there are labor shortages, when you are able to get the products or services you want, the prices, I mean, that's part of what has contributed to inflation in our prices, right? So it isn't just people who are actively seeking work or people who are actively hiring for that work. It affects everybody. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And then the those rising costs and inflation, and now we're demanding greater compensation, uh -huh. right? And so, I mean, it's just, it's this cyclical issue that yeah. there, there are too many factors to really unravel in, in one discussion. It's just a really complicated uh, problem. I don't know how we're going to resolve it actually. So let's talk just just a little bit about the point that you were making about want, you know having to pay more compensation. Things changed during COVID in a variety of ways. One of those was going to shutting down offices and workplaces and everybody working from home. Mm -hmm. And at first, for some people and for some employers, that was a very awkward transition. Yeah. But it became apparent to a, a lot of people and a lot of employers within a fairly short period of time that, huh, this actually works. Mm -hmm. It provided a little more flexibility for, for the worker to be able to you know, step away and start a load of laundry and then come back to their computer or whatever it might be, working with the kids who were home from school, mm -hmm. a variety of things. And for employers, they found that not having, in some cases, to maintain high rent or lease or you know, some of the other elements that contributed to cost of doing business it was all of a sudden, and, and production didn't necessarily go down. In some cases, it actually went up. Yeah. And so now we've seen as we're coming out of the COVID, this COVID time where everybody's been isolated, mm -hmm. employers who are continuing the work at home or hybrid settings where it's mostly work at home and maybe only occasionally or rarely come in to the office or into the workplace, I'm just, do you think, first of all, what have you seen good, bad, or otherwise? And what do you think that's going to look like over the long term? Yeah, I mean, it is truly good, bad, and otherwise. Um, whether you're the company or whether you're the employee, uh, depending on the nature of your work, um, it really is, it's not a one answer fits all kind of situation. So yeah, for a lot of those folks who pandemic hit, we made that awkward sometimes transition to remote work. And then companies were like, all right, come on back. There were quite a few folks who said, no, thanks. I, I proved that I could do my job from home and I would like to mm -hmm. continue doing that for, for tons of reasons, right? Whether yeah. it was they were saving money and time on the commute, childcare uh, situation, and literally being able to move a load of laundry along in between meetings is, is priceless for some people. So yeah, there was definitely the, the employee's desire oftentimes mm -hmm. to retain that remote work option. Um, but there are some cons to that, right? We have a uh, company culture uh, right. loyalty to the organization. You we're seeing right now the great reshuffle people job hopping around. And, and some argue that it's because they don't have that connection to the organization. And it's hard to build that connection uh, with the remote workforce. So there are a lot of pros and cons to this. And I think a lot of organizations are, moving forward with flexibility. We, we, need a, we need a hybrid model. We need some in-office time and we need to respect the worker's desire for that, that flexibility, the opportunity to, yeah. to go home and cover childcare when needed, the, the opportunity. And honestly, we're seeing some benefits to having a flexible uh, work structure because if I have a sick kiddo, but I feel fine, but I need yes. to go home. I can I can continue working and being productive from home now. Um, it's not my first choice. I personally like going into the office, but 
if needed, I can continue producing while working from home. And that is a benefit. So I think moving forward, if possible, I think hybrid is probably here to stay. It's funny because I think back um, longer ago than I'm going to mention, but okay, I will mention it was back in the early 80s. There was a book called Mega Trends by John Nesbitt. I think it's been updated and, and rewritten by him several times. There have probably been companion books. But one of the things that he talked about in there predicting for the future was that more people would be what was commonly being called telecommuting. Yeah. And that that would have an impact both on being a positive because of the very things that you mentioned as pros, but would also have an impact on how people socialize mm -hmm. and how people become a part of corporate culture and that type of thing. And so it's interesting to see all these years later that yeah. we've now we were kind of forced to experience that and how it's, it's had that long-term effect. You mentioned compensation and we've talked a little bit about things like now having to um, that this idea of remote or hybrid work has become one of the factors that employers have to think about. What are some other comps or benefits or things that employers have had to really seriously look at in order to try to attract good workers? Yeah, I think that uh, upping that, total compensation package. Um, right now we're competing for candidates. You know, wh why would one person choose this company over that company when there are 10 million jobs posted, right? How do you, how do you attract that talent? So we're, I think a lot of companies are building out that total compensation package with things like, you know, adding counseling services to, okay. if it wasn't already a part of their health benefits, making sure that that is something they highlight, uh, increasing, the company match for retirement, right? For how much they'll put into your 401k, other perks. I mean, I I think it's kind of an endless list of what we're trying to offer to make mm -hmm. it seem like we're, we're the better company to work at. Everyone, you know, they're putting together that total compensation package, thinking of it in terms of total compensation or encouraging, um, you know, internal mobility. You, you can move around jobs. You don't have to change organizations in order to try something new or, on the job training, we'll train you for that role that you want. Do you want to do this? Well, we'll go ahead and we'll train you for that thing that you want. Um, because I think we did see a lot of folks in this great reshuffle section, right? They're trying to upskill, reskill, and switch switch career paths, right? And so if companies, yeah. we're open to that and we'll even help you do it, just stay with us. And so I think that's another one of those perks that organizations are working on offering. I, I think that's interesting. You know, it's it's uh, I, also the question that kind of goes through my mind. I don't know if you have a, a clear answer for this. Does it put companies in a position because there are more limited applicants of potentially hiring underqualified oh. people? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I'm not speaking about my company in particular, but helping others job search right now. If you don't meet all the requirements, you should still apply, right? right. If, you, if you look at who's available out there um, and prove, show that you're willing to learn. And I think one of the things you can do is work on some upskilling on your own before the fact, right? Just because you don't have a computer science degree doesn't mean you can't go learn some of those skills with all the incredible online resources that are available. So right. you can position yourself to to pursue jobs that maybe you weren't qualified for, you know, two, three years ago. But now with the limited options and with the opportunity to upskill on your own, those are suddenly more available. Yeah. I mean, I see lots of jobs. I still look at postings, partially because I'm just curious as to how yeah. it looks now. And a lot of office jobs, for instance, want people with Microsoft <laughs> Office. And some people go, oh, you know, I'm not good or I'm not good at Excel spreadsheets. I'm not good at Excel. You can find online, you can find YouTube videos and online courses, many things for free that will walk you through how to do a lot of the things that you need to do just to start to gain that comfort level enough to where you can then take off on your own and continue to learn. Yeah, 100 percent. And I, I love LinkedIn Learning. Yeah. Uh, I think that's another great free resource that folks can take advantage of. You could also pay. Um, you know, a small fee for a month or so and get even more uh, LinkedIn learning mm -hmm. uh, resources. So I, I just really think that there's a lot of great opportunity and job seekers have a lot of power right now. 
um, there's a lot of opportunity and there's a, there are so many resources available to help them make switches if they want to. Uh, you mentioned LinkedIn, and I just want to mention LinkedIn for a minute here and ask you, how important is it? I mean, LinkedIn started off as just a place where you kind of put your profile and you networked professionally, and it has grown much more robustly. I mean, I remember thinking when I first got onto LinkedIn, it's the modern equivalent of passing along your business card. You just, you know, you connect with people on LinkedIn and they saw your profile. Now there's so much more out there. Mm -hmm. In, it, you mentioned LinkedIn learning I and mean, job posting. People look for you, get these connections with recruiters. You also get certain spam. Yeah. But how important is it if you are in the job market or even just currently working someplace to utilize LinkedIn effectively? And I'm thinking, have your profile up to date, mm -hmm. um, share information, look at other people's posts and on LinkedIn and, and respond to them. Look mm -hmm. for people who are your second generation LinkedIn connections and look for introductions. All of that. How important is LinkedIn? Yeah, I mean, that old saying of you got to know someone, um, you know, if you want a job at that place, you got to know someone. It's still true. Yeah. You know, it's still a real thing. And I, I like LinkedIn because you can see connections right? Mm -hmm. You can see who's connected to who's connected, right? And so you can find your way in. You can find that you got to know someone through LinkedIn. And it is important to participate in that professional community so that you know what the, the current topics are right now, right? You know what people in that industry are talking about um, so that when you go in for an interview, um, you know what are, the, what are the current buzzwords I see talking about what's the what's the latest technology what are other companies doing that I could use for ideas it's a great it's a great place for you know that thought leadership too, to figure out like what's coming what's changing um, what trends should I be paying attention to LinkedIn really is the only social media that I use um, it is it is the space where I, I spend a lot of my time yeah. Carissa is asking, do you think LinkedIn is only useful for certain types of industries and job roles? Is it is it universal enough that you can use it no matter what your career path or what kind of industry you're in? I would I would argue that you could. I mean, I'm seeing more and more different folks popping up there um, for even especially entrepreneurs. I mean, I feel like it's a place to I just don't know how many jobs where having a network isn't important. Right. Right. Like uh, I think you want that network. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to address this a little bit because I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm retired, but that doesn't mean I'm dead. Right. I, I would still look at potential opportunities within my field. I was in nonprofit work for 20 plus years. And part of that time, I was a professional fundraiser. Part of that time, I was a manager or executive with organizations. And part of that time, I was an independent consultant. And I've used LinkedIn extensively to make connections and to look for work in the nonprofit sector. But I'm also aware of the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm at retirement age yeah. and Corianne's asking about age discrimination. I mean, obviously, you know, when you're interviewing for a job, a prospective employer can't ask about age and everybody puts that, you know, they don't discriminate against age, mm -hmm. but this kind of leads to how we present ourselves, what our resume looks like, et cetera. And I want to talk to you briefly about resumes and how that has changed. But let's address very quickly this age discrimination, potential age discrimination thing. If I go in for, if I apply for a job or go in for a, an interview and I'm 66 years old, mm -hmm. you know, th there must be ways that someone in an older age category can present themselves in a way that doesn't telegraph. I'm not going to be with you very long. You're going to invest in me and I'm, I'm just going to be here for a brief period of time. But flip side of that, I guess, Addie, is that We've seen a trend anyway, even people often point to the millennials. I don't know that that's where the finger should be pointed, but because the entire environment changed even before COVID, yeah. where this idea of I'm going to be with a company for 30 years or even 10 years, yeah. that shifted a lot. But is there anything that people who are in the older age category specifically can do to present themselves in a way that doesn't automatically get them aced out? Yeah, no. And so I am a recruiter. Um and, and before this, I was doing career advising. I think that I'm, it's not the, the age thing, I don't really think. I think it's if you look out of touch with what's current. I think it's not, I'm not looking at numbers, um, you know, when they were born. I'm looking at, are they in touch with what is current? 
with the yeah. trends, with the technology? Are they are they in touch with the content that we're thinking about? Like you right now, you said you're 66, mm -hmm. right? But you're podcasting. That's yeah. That's that's hip. That's that's with it. That's with the technology. I like You're to think of myself that way. Pretty cool, right? So I think that that puts you in touch with what's current and relevant right now. Um, if you are out of touch with, and then that's why I said, you know, stay on LinkedIn. Get immerse yourself in the current topics, the current trends, the current technologies that we're using. Engage in those conversations to to be with it, right? Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I liked the question. Was it Corey, Corey Ann? Corey Ann who asked that. And and with that, I think it's also, Addie, you could also mention that in most communities, there are things that uh, AARP or even there are like senior centers yep. that will offer free classes, seminars and things. And a lot of them are yeah. things like even, you know, you can look or even on your community bulletin boards and through the Parks Bureau and other places will offer courses, sometimes focused specifically on seniors who... Yeah that are designed to help you get more comfortable with technology and, and various things that could help you stay relevant in that way. Yeah. Can we talk briefly about resumes? Boy, have those changed since, yeah. <laughs> since I first, I mean, when I first entered the job market X number of years ago, you didn't even have a resume. You looked in the paper, Sunday paper, usually under want ads, job yeah. postings, you circled the ones you wanted. You either made a phone call or you actually, sent a, a, a resume maybe, um, lots of times it was simply come into our office and fill out an application on site. Maybe you'd walk away that day and get a phone call or maybe you'd be asked to stay for an interview, et cetera, et cetera. And over the years, then it went to, you had to have a resume and those resumes often were very text heavy and they were very cumbersome and difficult to get all, especially if someone had already been working for a number of years, you might have a two or three page resume that listed everything you'd done, every place you worked. And it was, it was like reading a novel. Yeah. And we've kind of moved away from that for a variety of reasons. Can you talk briefly about how resumes have changed and what a resume now needs to be focused on? Right. So, you know, one thing we talked about the LinkedIn profile, your LinkedIn profile really is your digital resume. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that updated, keep it current. Um, fill it out, have a profile picture, right? Have a banner that represents you. Fill out that as if it is your resume because it is a really powerful digital resume that's available and visible for folks to, to poach you, right? On the other direction, if you're a job seeker, be visible and be available um, on LinkedIn. And that's a great place to put yourself out there. On paper, that, that resume, it has changed. When you were talking about that two to three page thing, please don't do that. Please don't. Um, no one wants to read that much anymore. And especially with the number of applicants and candidates that we're sifting through, um, keep it concise and brief. We're looking at, because we are just talking about be current, be with it. I'm looking at the last like five to 10 years max, right? Those are the relevant skills. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Look at that. There's my Juan Solting one. So it's really clean, straightforward. I would say avoid word templates, right? The ones that they provide for you that you can fill in. They're pretty laborious to edit and revise. They also encourage a lot of really bad habits like paragraphing. Please don't, please don't write paragraphs. Stick with some bullet points. Um, so this is the student one. Oh yeah. And then, and your then there's the professional one. one. Yeah. For professionals, you would put your relevant work experience at the top. That's what we're looking for. Um, leadership experience. Yeah. Education is important, but when you're a professional who has experience, often your work experience will, will trump that education. So you're putting the most relevant stuff at the top. It's clean. It's concise. It's not fancy. It doesn't have photos or graphics. Um, yeah. And the other thing to pay attention to is that we're often using an applicant tracking system. So the first thing that you have to get through as a, as a candidate is the computer, right? The, yeah. the program that's set up to look for relevance. So you do need to tailor your resume for each job opportunity. And you do want to integrate and utilize the keywords. The, key yeah. phrases. I mean, you really do. If you're applying for a project management position, include a section in your resume that's project management, right? Um, and, and match it. Don't be afraid to use some of those exact categories because right. what you're communicating is, I read the job description and I truly do believe that I match it. I align with it. And here's how. And so show us on paper. 
And really, you only need a page. Yeah. Truly. No matter what. And, and you know, we're, we're running out of time here and there's so much more I'd like to talk about. I think it's um, you and I talked about this, Addy. I think it's almost a given that you're going to be back at some point because there's a lot more to talk about. I mean, I'd love to talk more about interviewing processes and, and a variety of things. I did want to share you provided some resources and I'm putting them up here, but we're actually I'm going to post these resources and some of the things that Addy has shared on the uh, Coffee Breaks with Steve page on Facebook and also on our roundtable. If you're not already a member of the Coffee Breaks with Steve roundtable, where we carry on some of the discussions, you should you should join that so that you see some of these things and we continue to converse on some of these these things uh, as they come up. So I, I just wanted to make sure that you knew these, there are going to be some resources available and you don't have to try to copy them down here or take a screenshot. I'll, I'll make those available. But uh, Addy, uh, thank you so much. Before you go, I want to ask you one thing. I want to let you give a plug. We mentioned in your bio that your husband, Nick, is a musician who does gigs. Yeah. Is Nick going to be any place in the uh, Spokane or, or surrounding area in the near future that people might be able, if they live around this area, might be able to go in and hear him? Yeah. Oh, and feel, feel free to check him out. Just look up uh, Nick Grow Music. Uh, he's on Facebook. He's got all of his uh, events scheduled there. He's doing a lot of private parties and weddings lately. And okay. so they're not open to the public. Um, in fact, we have one at like four o'clock today. We've got to go for a private party. He's playing the music for it. But yeah, he plays at local local breweries, wineries around town. Just check his schedule out. Farmer's markets too. Those are really fun. I like it when he plays those. He's playing at Green Bluff, I think this upcoming week, um, Beck's Harvest House. So yeah, come come join him. He's really, really good. I love and, it. And obviously, from what you said, if you have a private party or wedding or something like that coming up and you live in this region, um, he's available for those types of things. Yep, he's great. Okay. Hey, Addy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your information and expertise. Enjoyed having you here. It was obviously a very robust discussion. Seen a lot in the chat going on here. You still have access to this chat. So if you want to go back and look at some of the things that... Uh, afterwards that have uh, been said and some of the questions that were asked that we didn't get to, and you can continue to comment on those. But Addie Grow, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. All right. That was fantastic. Listen, before we go today, I, I know we're running a little bit late. I don't apologize for that. This was worthwhile. I want to share a little bit of what's coming up in uh, the next couple of weeks, at least, and just tell you kind of what I'm, what's coming up down the road. Next week is going to be a fun one. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the topic is you had one job. We're going to talk about some of those funny, frustrating and downright ridiculous mistakes that we see out in public where somebody was had a job to do and you kind of shake your head and go, wait a minute, what happened here? How didn't they how come they didn't catch this? So that's going to be next uh, Saturday. We're going to share some pictures. We're going to share some of those uh, that we've encountered personally and tell some of the stories. And if you got some, you can you can share some as well. But I think that'll be a lot of fun. I just want to let you know that in a couple of weeks, uh, the third, I think it is, Labor Day weekend, coffee breaks will not be on the air. We're taking advantage of the Labor Day weekend, take some time off, even though I'm retired. But part of that is we have family coming into town and we want to be able to just spend that time with family. So we're going to take a little break on the third, but we'll be back on the 10th. We're going to be talking about a new documentary that is coming out called Tipping Point. It's getting ready to play in some of the film festivals. And it's a documentary that was done in Portland, Oregon, um, around and, and through the protests that took place after George Floyd and how Portland became kind of a focal point of those protests and really set a, a climate for how America has responded to a lot of things. It is not does not lean one way or another politically. It is a, an unbiased very straightforward and objective uh, film. And we're going to be talking to one of the producers as our guest that day. That's on the 10th. And then uh, looking a couple of weeks after, uh, well, a few weeks beyond that, we're going to be talking about something called the Mandela effect. I'm not going to go into detail, but if you already know what that is, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. If not, look it up. And then we're going to be doing another interview and talking about a, a children's book um, that is out and talking to the author. And the book is called The Kite That Touched the Sky. It's a kid's book. We're going to be meeting with and talking to the author of that book about the book and about kite flying. So those are some things coming up in the next few weeks. 
Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We're looking at some other things as we go into the fall. It's always fun to uh, to do these, to have these people be a part of the conversation. And I'm just going to remind you again that you can make your own recommendations. You can let us know what topics you would like us to talk about on Coffee Breaks. And even if you have ideas about guests, particularly if you know somebody and can make an introduction, let us know. Listen, we're done. Uh, I just want to say once again that I appreciate all of you. You are a blessing and you are the reason that I keep getting up on Saturday mornings to do this is because we get to have this great conversation. Still a lot going on around us in this world. And we can't uh, always throw all of ourselves into everything that's happening in our communities. But we all have power. We all have a voice. We all have some resource that we can give in one way or another. So please remember to be careful, but find a way to make a difference in your world this week. God bless you. Have a great week.